Hello and welcome to this third lecture in design patterns for software engineering. In this lecture I'm going to cover behavioral patterns or some of them, uh, specifically command, observer, state and strategy. So behavioral patterns deals with how the system functions at runtime. So it can be managing the control flow, it could be uh, uh, managing how things collaborate with each other and uh, different entities. Uh, can concern algorithms and an assignment of responsibility as well. There are two different kinds of behavioral patterns. So there are class behavioral patterns, which then uses inheritance to distribute behavior. And then you have object behavioral patterns, which use composition aggregation. Um, for instance, when you uh, describe a group of objects that should collaborate or cooperate. Starting off, uh, I'm going to start with something simple that you may have encountered before, the observer. So observer is used whenever you have unscheduled updates. Um, you've probably seen like the whole add listener, remove listener, and then you, you get updates whenever there's something being triggered. So it, it does keep consistency between related objects and it is helpful when you don't know before and when um, you know, someone is interested in, in uh, state change information. Looking at the UML, so we have an up, uh, observer that can perform updates and we have a subject which um, which you're then observing so to speak um, here you have the attach or add listener the detach or remove listener and the notify method so basically uh, to describe it simple um, when you attach a listener basically you add it to a, a list or a vector or something similar like that and whenever you uh, do a notif notify you go through this list and basically call this update uh, on each of the observers that means um, you get the, the observer basically is notified okay there is new material then they can either go and fetch that material or if the update itself uh, carried a parameter you might already have the information that you requested Looking at just a, a very quick example, um, okay, so we have some form of positioning system again. Um, here we have uh, line one to three, there's an interface called position listener and that has the position update. So that is um, the observer. Um, now this position device starting at line five, that is the, the subject, the thing being observed. So there we have the add position listener, we have the remove position listener, and the vector that you add and remove from. And we have the notify method, which basically, whenever that is called, it goes through the list and calls position update on every observer that has been added to the list. Um, so here's the position uh, push position device, uh, or the position device. Uh, so whenever a new position is set, so whenever there is an update, you call the notify method, which then triggers this flow. And in this case, we also have the get position method. So whenever this update is called on the observer, it can then go here and get, you know, use the get position function to get the update. The alternative to using a get position method here would simply be to um, add the um, the update uh, in the uh, parameters for the get or for the update method. And then finally, just uh, looking at the observer here. Um, so you have uh, an instance of something you want to uh, find out whenever there are updates, you add position, or you add yourself as a listener to that subject. And whenever position update is called, in this case, you then go to the subject and, and calls the get position. So uh, for observer, this creates uh, an abstract coupling between subject and observer. You, you are uh, automatically notified whenever there are updates, um, which does then support broadcast communication and you get the unexpected updates. The next pattern uh, is a state pattern. One of my favorites because it's, it, it models the way I'm thinking and it models the whole uh, state 
uh, kind of state chart, state diagrams, etc. So if you imagine a system that has been modeled as a state chart, um, so you have specific states and each state can go to another uh, state. So basically you have a, a transition model. So if you have a system behave that behaves like that, um, you can create very explicit states. So the alternative of doing the alternative to the state pattern would be to just have conditional cases or a switch case or an if else, uh, which make it very complex and it doesn't give you a very good overview. So I actually like this, and then here's an example of a TCP client connection. So at the closed state, you can then go to uh, uh, active open, or you can call active open to get to the sync send uh, state, or you can uh, time out to go to, a, um, or no, you can um, do a passive open from there as well. Um, and, and then from um, there, you can go to established, and um, can go from established, you can of course close the connection, etc. So each different state here has a very specific uh, transition and you know kind of what the, the functions and that you need to call in order to get to each state. So rather than going like if closed, then uh, if this happens, then go there and then do a switch case for each of these states, uh, you do specific or explicit change. And here again, we use polymorphism. So we have a state, uh, we have an implementator A and B. Um, and I'm going to show you um, this in code very briefly. So again, we use this TCP connection as an example. So if the connection is enclosed, we can do an active open or a passive open. If the connection is established, we can tr transmit the information or close the connection. So this is what I'm going to show you in code. So first off, we have this TCP state, which is an abstract class. And basically here you define all the operations that could happen. You can even make some small implement default implementation for each of these if you want. And then uh, if you look at what would what would happen if we didn't use the state pattern, you're going to have this switch case. And for TCP closed, you can do things for TCP listening, you can do certain things. Now imagine that you have quite a few states, this is going to be quite messy quite quickly. And you're also going to have one person who knows how everything operates, but it's very difficult to di distribute implementation of such a thing. So you end up with having very, very large classes, which has lots of behavior. So using the state pattern instead, then we make a specific class in this case called TCP connection. Um, and the default state in TCP connection, looking at the line B4 or B5, um, the default state is that it's closed. So that is how you start uh, the TCP connection, you start as closed. Now from this state, the closed state, which is the default behavior, you can do active open, you have a method for that, you can do passive open. So very explicitly you change, um, you basically change class to a specific uh, state. Uh, so we have here, if we go to the TCP close state, um, then you can do an active open from there, you can do a passive open. Uh, if you uh, look at B1, you have a TCP listening state, and from listening you can do acknowledge, uh, and so on. So very explicitly you change state, and each class in itself has all the behavior inside of it. Um, so it localizes state specific behavior, which also makes it much easier to implement things because if you find a bug or something in a specific state, you basically go to just that class and you change the behavior. Um, so you don't need to know the implementation. It makes it very easy to read the code as well. You can just look at the file names to find out how everything fits together. Of course, uh, this whole um, state transition might be very difficult to illustrate. But if you include the state diagram um, as a documentation, then you don't need that much else. You don't need many comments in terms of from here, you can go to there, you can basically just submit this uh, state diagram. Um, but yeah, you do need to understand who defines the state transition. And this is also a matter of uh, creating and destroying a lot of objects um, back and forth that you might want to uh, consider. Uh, the next pattern I'm going to go through is the strategy pattern, and it's very similar to the state pattern. 
uh, in that you use polymorphism to change explicitly between different strategies in this case. So here you use this pattern you use when you have very similar behavior or, or you, you have uh, the same purpose, different behavior. Uh, you might have several different sorting algorithms you want to switch between. So you might want to sort by name or sort by age or sort by address or something like that. Um, so rather than just doing uh, if uh, the user has selected to sort by name, then do something. If the user has selected to sort by age, then do something. Rather than having that uh, conditional case, um, which can be very long and difficult, you basically make a specific implementation for sorting by age, specific implementation in a class for sorting by um, address, etc. Um, so um, the UML, of course, looks very similar to the state pattern. Um, you have a strategy, I have concrete instance strategy A and B, etc. An implementation of this and uh, using the address book as an example. Um, again, you make a very explicit change. Um, so in this case, the default behavior that we did in the address book is to sort by name. Uh, if you want to change the strategy, you do it explicitly uh, and then you sort and then you can have different implementations. So sort by name, here you have a, a specific class called sort by name, uh, where you can have sort by age and you do the sorting there. Uh, and basically, if you run a test on this, um, if you start creating an address book and, and sort, it's going to be the default behavior, which would be uh, the sort by name in this case. Uh, so the first name would be you know something like Adam or something. Uh, and then if you change the strategy to sort by age, the, the person with the lowest age will come first instead. So uh, it is an alternative to subclassing. It, it does actually help uh, developers have some freedom because as long as what you implement inside of that um, class, the you know, sort by age class, then you are free to use whatever algorithm to make it more efficient and you have some freedom as long as you provide that sort behavior, so to speak, you have, as long as you adapt or uh, implement that interface uh, that's been specified. So you eliminate all these conditional statements, makes it much easier to understand and see the code because it's split into several classes. Of course, you get a lot more class objects uh, in this case as well. So that might be something to mind. The next pattern is the command pattern. So basically, uh, the command pattern is being used whenever you want to encapsulate a request. Uh, if you've used uh, Java, um, you've probably seen this as part of the menu system if you want if you did any graphical implementations. So whenever you um, access a menu item like exit or file open or um, any of those uh, archive or whatever menu item, basically what you do then is um, you send a, a command, and then your code is basically just runs execute. Otherwise, if you didn't use the command pattern, you would have to again do a, a switch case or, or a conditional statement like if menu item one is selected, then do this. If menu item two is selected, then do that. Uh, in this case, you can actually decouple the menu from your behavior and you don't really care uh, what uh, command is being selected because all you do is you run execute. and, and uh, looking at the UML, so you have the command, you have a function call execute or a method call execute here. Um, and whenever it's being called, um, it's someone is receiving it. Some receives an action and, and that receiver basically just runs whatever. Um, so it runs receiver dot action in this case. Um, and just to show you again the, the you know, uh, Swing implementation in Java uh, would look something like that. So you do what do you do use this um, command whenever you want to decouple like um, the request and the execution of things. Uh, so it makes it you actually promote a weak coupling here. Um, and you uh, you don't really care about the implementation or actually even what um, is being run all you you know all you need to know is that they ha it has this execute method that you can call uh, 
Uh, this of course does support undo because you can keep a list of all the commands being run and you can in each command because it's it's it's, its own separate class you can basically store the behavior so if you want to do an undo you go to a previous state or a previous uh, command um, use the the stored behavior that it has you know performed so whenever it calls the execute is called then you can also store that whatever it's being done and then you can uh, recall it um, so it does uh, support logging changes and stuff like that as well. Um, so yeah, it's very easy to add new commands as well, uh, because you know, each command is, is isolated and, and can encapsulate it in some class. So this is also high cohesion, because uh, every command is its own class, uh, and it only does you know that command specifically. So those were the behavioral patterns, and... I thank you for listening and the next lecture will be about architectural patterns. Thank you very much.